Uh, good evening, uh, and welcome. I'm, I'm Larry Ball, the uh, program chair for Applied Economics. Uh, welcome to the fall 2015 Mark Summerlin Lecture. Uh, we're grateful, as always, to Mark Summerlin, who is here, for uh, our alumnus for sponsoring uh, this series. Uh, Frank Weiss reminds me this is this is the 11th uh, biannual uh, or I'm sorry, semi-annual lecture. So we're we're uh, just beyond five years and going strong. Um, uh, tonight we're delighted to have uh, Miles Korak uh, visiting from a. Uh, I guess his full-time position is a, a different national capital uh, north, north of here. Uh, he's professor of economics at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs uh, at the University of Ottawa. And uh, th this year he's a visiting professor at Harvard. And he's going to talk to us about uh, income inequality and intergenerational mobility. And I don't think I have to tell anybody this is a very, very, very hot topic. Um, a, a lot of interest in it, um, a lot of people talking about it. Uh, one feature, of course, is that it's a very politically charged topic. Uh, I think probably we could go a few blocks in this neighborhood and, you know, find 20 people who would proclaim themselves experts and come tell us what's what about income inequality, uh, but most of them uh, would have one ideological agenda or, or another. Um, I, th I think we found here somebody who um, is uh, addressing this very topical topic uh, in in a uh, in a scholarly way, and we can all learn something from it. So, uh, Miles Korak, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I should say I'm really quite honored to be here to associate my name in some small way with uh, the program here at John Hopkins and with Mr. Sumlin's uh, generosity. Um, I'm going to begin the uh, talk with um, three facts that motivate three questions. And I hope th as we progress through the uh, evening, we'll have answers to those questions. But I think to understand the topic or appreciate it, you probably have to know something about my taste in music to begin with. So this, this man is a, a hero of mine. Does anyone recognize him? Yeah, that's Leonard Cohen, of course, all right? And uh, I took the lyrics or, uh, from one of Cohen's songs, and some of the words struck me. Um, the poor stay poor, the rich get rich. That's how it goes, everybody knows. And if you know anything about Leonard Cohen, he's from uh, Montreal, uh, Canada. And if you've ever been to Montreal, what's the defining feature of the geography of Montreal? You're nodding back there. Yeah, there's a, big, there's a big hill in the middle of the city. And Mr. Cohen was born on the top of that hill. So he, he's obviously a very uh, talented individual, but he started at the top. And his life had certain ups and downs, uh, but he's, I think, fair to say, still at the top. So in some sense, um, the rich do get uh, rich in, in, in Mr. Uh, Cohen's case. Mm -hmm. um, and, <laughs> and if there's enough time during the question period, I can break into my best rendition of, of Leonard Cohen. But <laughs> we probably don't want that. Um, but my other hero is this woman. And you will recognize her as uh, Shania Twain. And Ms. Twain had her professional career take off, um, of, um, oh, I guess, in the 1990s. She's a country folk, country pop uh, singer who rode this new wave of technology in the 1990s called the CD. And, and her songs sold throughout the world. And she, at one point, became, I think, one of the best-selling uh, singers in all of history making probably a lot more money than, than Mr. Cohen. But her roots are much more humble. If you read uh, Ms. Twain's uh, autobiography, she's also a Canadian from uh, an, uh, a small town in northern Ontario. And she grew up in a family of five children. Uh, they had three different biological fathers. Uh, the stepfather, who was a formative figure in her life, was a, uh, a native person, an aboriginal. Um, uh, there was a certain amount of stress in that household, abuse. She described moving every couple of years, at one point living in a basement apartment with a dirt floor. And somehow she found her way to Nashville and somehow developed her innate talents. 
and now, in addition to owning a small cottage in northern Ontario, has this beautiful house on the shores of Lake Geneva, and for a time was building a palatial place uh, in New Zealand. And that's a case in which someone started at the very bottom of the socioeconomic ladder and rose to the very top. And so this talk is about that kind of movement, the relationship between your outcome in adulthood and the family background that you in some sense inherited or are coming from. Is it true that the rich always stay rich and the poor stay poor? Uh, or is there a lot of movement up and down according to talents and energy and motivation? All right. And so that's what economists mean by intergenerational mobility. And so I'll speak probably in those more technical terms, but sometimes in policy circles you hear this discussed as social mobility. But I mean, you know, the Leonard Cohens and the Shania Twains of the world. All right. Um, and we certainly want to fill the question period up because if I try to sing Shania Twain's songs, we're <laughs> going to be in deep trouble. So let me start with those three facts that generate for me three questions. And the first fact is that generational earnings mobility varies significantly across many countries. So now in this picture, I'm looking at, and I'll define it a little bit more clearly as we go along, but think of it as the strength of the tie between your earnings as an adult and your parents' earnings when they were raising you. <coughs> and so more stickiness, okay, means less mobility. So in countries like the United Kingdom, Italy, and in the United States, a figure of 0.5 means that about 50% of inequality gets passed on across the generations. If we lived in those countries, or in the United States, as we do, and your father made twice as much as my father, that is 100% more, it would mean that as adults, you would be making 50% more than I would. On the other hand, if we lived in one of the Nordic countries like Finland or Norway or Denmark, that 100% difference in our parental backgrounds would in one generation shrink to 20%. So even if your parents made twice uh, as much as my parents, you'd be only making about 20% more than me. There might be a tie between our incomes and our parents' incomes, but not between our incomes and our grandparents' incomes. All right? So there's no stickiness. Uh, there's a lot of mobility. And I find it interesting that the difference should be so great amongst all of these uh, rich uh, countries. Okay? But that raises a question we have to answer tonight. Is that difference something that merits public policy attention? Okay? So that's the first fact and the first question I want to put to you. The second is that generational earnings mobility varies, but it varies in a particular way. So in this graph, as you move horizontally from left to right, I've ranked these countries according to the amount of inequality that existed, mm, roughly speaking, about a generation ago. So a low Gini coefficient of 20 or, or so uh, in Finland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, versus a Gini coefficient of above 30 in Italy, the United States, and the United Kingdom. So you can think of that figure, the Gini, as the fraction of total income that would have to get redistributed to have perfect equality of outcomes. Okay? And then vertically, as you go from uh, bottom to top, I've arranged the countries according to our measure of uh, the generational earnings mobility. So remember, mobility is high when we are low in this graph. You know, economists have this way of uh, inverting things around. <laughs> and as we move vertically, mobility falls. And you can see a relationship here uh, between these countries. High inequality at a point in time is associated with a low degree of generational mobility. And I've drawn this straight line to help you, uh, help your eye uh, imagine that relationship. Okay? And in spite of the line being straight, this graph is called, does anybody know? Mark, you know. You, the Great Gatsby Curve. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is the one question I got. Well, 
there you go, yeah. If it's a straight line, why are you calling it a curve? Well, um, the name The Great Gatsby Curve certainly got a lot of attention, and it's due uh, to Alan Kruger, the former chairman of the um, Council of Economic Advisors, who gave a speech here in Washington, I think in 2012, January 2012 or so, and at that point uh, gave this curve this name, which had sort of existed in the economics literature for, for some years. And that drew a lot of public attention. You can see, as, as, as Larry alluded to, why this would be controversial, all right? The United States, all right, the land of opportunity, all right? Uh, citizens of the U.S. sometimes accept a good deal of inequality because they know there's a great deal of mobility that underlies that inequality. That even if I'm at the raw end of the uh, stick, I can aspire to something better, and certainly my children can through their efforts and motivation and talents. But here we have a curve that's saying the American dream is more likely in Denmark. <laughs> All right. Uh, and it would be tempting to slide down the Great Gatsby curve. And so here is one policy, uh, play Robin Hood. Tax the rich, give to the poor, and you solve two problems at once. You reduce inequality in the here and now, and you promote mobility across generations. All right. But certainly, to be able to tell that kind of story, you need to understand causation and what's driving this curve. And I hope that uh, as we come out of this uh, discussion tonight, we have a better sense of the underlying causes and a better appreciation of, of therefore, what the policy implications could be. All right? So mobility varies. It varies in a particular way. And uh, it's somewhat lower where we have higher inequality. And so the third fact is inequality is rising. So I've taken this picture from a very uh, nicely done uh, research document by the OECD called Divided We Stand. And let me try to decipher it for you. Basically, the message here is in most of the rich countries, inequality has gone up. And at the base of these arrows is the Gini coefficient for 1985, and the tip of the arrow is the Gini coefficient for 2008, just before the crisis hit. So you can see in the United States uh, in 1985, it already had a very high level of inequality compared to many other countries, and it increased. The point is it's increasing quite significantly almost everywhere. And for us, the question is, does that mean as we move into this era of higher inequality, we risk sliding up the Great Gatsby Curve and embedding in our society less intergenerational mobility. Okay. So those are my three motivating uh, issues. Can I just sort of pause for a minute for any questions of clarification or, or concerns, just to be sure we're all on the same wavelength? Yeah, go ahead. Can I ask one question? Absolutely. So uh, a year ago, Mr. Pachetti came to great fame about inequality, but he spoke a little bit about a different inequality, wealth inequality. Right. And um, Larry Summers, who, if he was here, would explain why he's smarter than everyone else, which is true, um, has within two years said that the greatest cause of wealth inequality was monetary policy, and the greatest cure for income inequality was monetary policy, which are admittedly different things. Um, are your, is it important to, at the beginning, define whether we're talking about wealth inequality or income inequality? I, that's a very important thing to say at the outset, so thank you for that. So I'm going to, I think that it is very important, but I'm not going to have anything to say on, on wealth. So one of the reasons we should really be concerned about this growth in inequality, particularly top uh, income inequality, is all those income flows each year, um, year in, year out, are going to change stocks and wealth. Um, I'm going to focus just on earnings mobility. Uh, but certainly a part of this story about intergenerational mobility has to do with, with, uh, with, with wealth. And I think people who have looked at it find that intergenerationally there's even more stickiness in wealth. All right. uh, so maybe I can offer a compliment to Larry Summers who's looking at the world in this macro perspective. This is going to be a, a, a discussion about the microeconomics of earnings and income uh, mobility. 
And I think it's fair to say that's one slice of this story. Okay. Yes? You're talking about the income of the generation's parents. If my parents started poor and became wealthy, what do you say their income is? During their parenting years, the average of that, where they ended up, what's the benchmark? That is actually a very important uh, issue in, in this literature and in the statistics of getting it right. So it's a lead in to, to this next slide. So wh why don't I answer that as we proceed? But I'll, I'll take your question before we go. Oh, good. All right. That's where we want to go. All right. That's exactly <laughs> right. So in both cases, uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, I don't know if you're former students of the program or not, but you want to look at these statistics uh, uh, critically. And this is where a lot of public policy discussion goes a little bit of array because, uh, 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 awry because people quickly impose what they want to see on the statistic and what it means. So let's just be clear what we're talking about. So the estimate I gave you is an estimate from this simple uh, regression to the mean uh, equation, which is actually due to Francis Galton back in the 1800s. Why is some outcome we care about? All right, so, you know, Mark, that, that could be wealth, all right? But in our case, it's going to be uh, earnings or, 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 or annual income. And I indexes a, uh, a family and T is a generation. So why are, is the adult uh, income of an individual of generation T, of family I, and we are relating that to the income of the previous generation at an individual level. So I need to know your income, and I need to know your parents' income. Now in this literature, and here's another caveat here, uh, the pictures I gave you are almost exclusively fathers and sons. So I'm going to talk about the masculine gender throughout here. Uh, and that's not because there aren't studies of mothers and daughters, but labor force participation has been one of the great uh, changes in the, in the, um, of, of, of women in the labor market. That complicates things. Uh, there's a marriage market. That complicates things. So the initial cuts in this literature focused on fathers and sons. Uh, I think those ki the, the kinds of reasons that were initially used certainly aren't defensible. Uh, but to maximize the number of countries, we'll look at fathers and sons. And so the statistic we're trying to measure is this beta, which is an elasticity. So the statistics I'm giving you, you should interpret it as the percentage difference in um, uh, children's outcomes for some given percentage difference in the parents' outcomes. And so it's important in getting an accurate estimate here, to get back to your question, uh, to get a sense of what we call permanent income. So if we have income in any one particular year, that's not good enough. So imagine what your income was when you were in your early 20s. <laughs> that is not a good marker of your permanent status uh, in life because uh, having uh, a certain degree of education, your income started to shoot up in your late 20s and early 30s. So ideally, we want to measure income uh, when you're in your sort of 40s, in your peak years, uh, and associate it with sort of a, perhaps a multi-year average to iron out all those sort of ups and downs uh, that might be associated both with uh, the growth in income uh, to your peak years and with just sort of uh, random shocks, a spell of unemployment or, or, or whatever. So what we're doing in this literature is trying to get a sense of what Milton Friedman would call your permanent income. And we do that usually by estimating or um, averaging over, over five, ten, ten, ten years. Okay? Now, what does that beta statistic mean? It's a broad summary measure of the degree of mobility. It could refer to mobility upwards and downwards. So it's not giving us any sense of directional change. And that probably is very important for public policy because when you see politicians talk about this statistic, they talk about the promise of upward mobility. All right? And on its own, the statistic doesn't tell us that. It's like uh, an appropriate statistic like the Gini coefficient is for inequality at a point in time. If you need to think about it uh, over time, it's your broad sort of go-to first measure. It also, you'll see in public policy discussions, people referring to intergenerational mobility as absolute mobility, okay? This generation cannot aspire to make as much as their parents' generation, okay? That's a statement about averages, all right? And probably captured by the constant in this, in this equation. 
or a statement like, will my children do better than I did? All right, so the base case here is, are you doing better than your own parents and by how much? And you have to think about that well, you know, in terms of ranks or in absolute numbers. So there's a host of other statistics that we need to round out this story and make it policy revel relevant. But this measure is just this broad summary measure. Uh, and the other assumption here is that it's constant throughout the income distribution. That the degree of mobility isn't any different for people at the very top or at the very bottom. So we have to make some of these assumptions. But the literature looks at them carefully, uh, uh, more or less, and, there, and there's a, a more subtle discussion. So when you take this into the public policy sphere and you see or you hear someone speaking, just very carefully try to parse out what they mean by intergenerational mobility. And you'll see commentators on the different side of the political spectrum mean different things. People on the right will often think of it in terms of absolute mobility. Oh, heck, you know, just think of all the great things Bill Gates has done uh, for us or Steve Jobs. You know, in my time, a cell phone was something you had to carry in a briefcase. And now everybody can put one in their, in their coat pocket. We're all better off. That's mobility in an absolute sense, okay? Uh, but Leonard Cohen probably meant something about ranks. The poor stay poor in a relative sense, and they, they can't take any steps up the ladder, even if the whole ladder has moved up. And that's more of a discussion on the left about relativities, all right? All right? And so this is uh, what it is. It's a broad summary measure of, uh, the, uh, of, of, of relative mobility, both up and down and all around, okay? So that's what we're talking about, and that's what I mean by mobility in, the, in, this, in this talk. And I want to sort of get a better sense of this parameter uh, and how we should think about it and, and the implications. Now, the other thing in policy, we relate this immediately, as I did when I was talking about uh, the American dream, to equality of opportunity. Okay? And this is, I think, um, why one of the reasons why the Great Gatsby Curve has gotten so much attention, because it relates inequality to equality of opportunity. But it doesn't really. There's something else in, in between. And there's the whole structure of opportunity in a society. And I draw here, I've learned a lot from reading a sort of a, a fellow who's sort of at the crossroads of economics, philosophy, and mathematics who teaches at Yale, uh, John Romer. And for Romer, in, um, equality of opportunity means that inequalities of outcomes aren't defensible if the re the result of different circumstances. What he's groping for is trying to parse out the inequality we see and figure out what fraction of inequality is morally defensible because of um, the fact that it results from individual effort and decisions that people should take responsibility for. And then the other fraction that is due to circumstances beyond their control circumstances for which, in some sense, they should be compensated, okay? And so he's looking at it, and the crux of the problem for him is, what are circumstances? How do we define circumstances? Once we understand what circumstances are, then we can make that division into effort uh, that we should take responsibility for, and circumstance that, in some sense, we should be compensated for. and. And Romer's been taken to task because, you know, that's not a science, that's not something we can do scientifically. And inherently, it's a value judgment where we draw that line between circumstance and effort. And what he outlines are sort of, if you will, four possible playing fields that we might seek to level. And each of them require us to make certain value judgments. Um, imagine living in a society in which nepotism governs outcomes, all right? The people who have the good jobs got them because their dads uh, facilitated that through networks or outright control. Most citizens of the rich countries would feel that if our, our situation in life is governed by nepotism, well, that is a circumstance that uh, public policy 
should seek to eliminate and compensate, compensate us for. Okay? At the other extreme, the differences in our outcomes might be due to just the genetic transmission of ability or the more subtle influence that parents have on us in raising us. All right? I mean, if, if height and beauty are transmitted intergenerationally, and if the labor market continues to value height and beauty across time, we should expect to see a correlation between parent and child incomes. All right? But should public policy level that playing field? Or if our parents do pay a lot of attention uh, to us uh, and help us through the many transitions in life, um, form our preferences, make us ambitious, um, make us defer immediate gratification, all right? Uh, and in a subtle way, you know, form our perspective on life. Should we somehow take away from uh, people who've had that kind of family uh, upbringing uh, as a result and call it a circumstance, all right? And you can sort of see in this literature what's called the problem of the family. <laughs> uh, we believe that, uh, uh, that in some sense the family is an autonomous unit and raising the children is, pro children is probably the most um, precious and important choice we make in life. And people should have that responsibility. But so different societies are going to draw that line differently. And we should, I think, ex accept that. So there's no simple way of parsing out uh, circumstance uh, and effort to clarify what equality of opportunity means. Although Romer says that it would, when it comes to children and some particular uh, outcomes for children, everything is circumstance, nothing is effort until you reach the age of majority. And I'll draw a little bit on that and give you a sense of how to operationalize R Romer's uh, uh, view. All right? So, um, You know, as economists, we like to think of hard facts and hard statistics, but inherently value judgments come into play here, and we can respect that people or people in different societies will make different uh, value judgments. So the issue for us is, is a completely flat parent-child gradient uh, necessarily a goal for public policy? Should we drive that beta to zero? All right? And I don't think we can make progress in that without um, doing some economic theory. So I'm going to give you a story in uh, three equations. All right? Since I'm an economist, I'm allowed at least three equations. The first is equation about payoffs. Uh, the second is an equation uh, about access. And the third one, if you let me use the word uh, very broadly, is about inheritance. So here's an outcome we care about, uh, call it uh, earnings or income, and it's going to be related to your human capital, those characteristics that um, you embody uh, that in some sense um, reflect an investment, in fact, uh, reflect some choices about developing your capacities. And it's going to be um, also, you know, the outcome is going to be related to a certain endowment, you know, perhaps your personality, I if you will. These things and a little bit of luck influence your, your income, okay? So what's important, important in our discussions is the return to human capital, uh, what I've called uh, gamma here. So for each year of education, what's, what's the payback, all right? And part of the growing inequality uh, in the United States and other countries is that return has changed uh, significantly so that uh, higher education gets you a lot more now than it did uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So that's an important driver of inequality overall. That's, uh, that's the payback. So how do you develop your human capital? Well, in this literature, in this simple model, it reflects on your endowments, how innately, if you will, uh, capable you are, all right? Not everybody uh, will benefit from uh, a graduate education, all right? And Presumably the most able uh, get higher levels of education. But it might, might also depend upon your uh, parents' income. If access to a university like this one is governed uh, by, I don't know, let's say very high tuition fees, 
then having rich parents might help you, all right? And this parameter here is meant to reflect the causal role of parental income on your capacities, okay? And that's what I meant by uh, access, all right? Some societies could drive that to zero. So the only thing determining how much education is just, you know, what's optimal for you as an individual, okay? Finally, you inherit uh, uh, an endowment from the previous generation. And in this literature, that's, you can think of it sort of almost innate, all right? It's like genetic transmission, okay? So uh, you get some endowment given by this parameter H from your parents. That feeds into your human capital, which then, then gets you a return. And uh, maybe if we live in a society in which um, the development of human capital depends on your parents' income, you get an extra kick. So here uh, is what we might have uh, is an equation like this in which two people of the same endowment, okay, equally able, equally capable in all of these other characteristics, well, the one from a richer background will be, end up making more, okay, if this theta is not zero, all right? So that's a playing field that we can imagine in Romer's view should be leveled. That's a circumstance. We've organized society such that getting a, a degree from Hopkins depends upon uh, how much your, your dad made. Hmm. Maybe we should have uh, a student loan or a student bursary program to level that playing field, okay? Given that the individuals are equally capable. We should, we should level that playing field. And our beta, if you sort of solve it out, is going to be higher as a result of theta not being zero, okay? But if we're in a situation in which um, that doesn't come into play, then beta is just the, in the degree to which endowments are inherited across generations. And maybe that's the playing field we shouldn't be leveling, all right? So what we've got mixed up in this par uh, parameter are a bunch of causal forces. The returns to education matter, and if inequality is growing as a result, that is going to uh, increase our intergenerational elasticity. That's the intuition behind the, the Great Gatsby curve. But inside the Great Gatsby curve, there are a lot of other things going on. If human capital becomes um, much more difficult to access uh, because of health care being driven by incomes, because of education being driven by incomes, uh, then that is also going to drive the beta. And uh, societies all will also differ by this component. Let's face it, there's no way we can turn the United States into a Denmark. Denmark is a small, very homogeneous country. And maybe it's got a different age. And maybe those countries along the Great Gatsby Curve, they just have a different variance in here, all right? And so you're seeing something we can't do anything about anyways. There are all kinds of uh, people with all kinds of abilities in this very huge and diverse country of the United States. Well, there's a lot more different H's out there in endowments, and there's no role for public policy, all right? Well, on the other hand, uh, higher education is free in Denmark, right? Uh, so you can see how you can have different views. I want to add a couple of wrinkles to this to prepare us for looking at the data. So here's the story in three equations with a couple of variations. One, I've stuck parental income right here. All right. So this is the role of parental networks or nepotism or whatever you want to call it, having a direct influence on your outcomes, independent of human capital. We can model it in different ways, uh, but we mo both might have the same degree, uh, but some of us have got a parent who helps us steer our way through the labor market, uh, make sure we get those crucial internships, uh, probably calls up a friend on Wall Street, and some of us don't, all right? And that's got nothing to do with human capital, it's got something to do with sort of raw power, if you will, all right? The other way the literature is going is to more carefully discuss these equations. This is rather simplistic, and we know that children go through a whole series of transitions in life. And so there's a distinction between, for example, the importance of the early years and early years education. 
uh, developing a child's capacities fully from the age of about an, being a newborn to the cusp of going to school is very important to be able to uh, capture uh, all the fullness of education later on. All right? And so, f for example, Jim Heckman's made so much of early years education and investment. So we should think of what's going on here as sort of many stages that build up. And we might have a policy for, uh, I don't know, um, the subsidization of graduate education and making sure everyone's got a bursary, but maybe that's not mo the most effective place to put our, our dollar. Maybe it's really in early childhood education that gives us the biggest bang for the buck. And so we have to be conscious that there are several layers going on uh, here as well. Yes? Is early childhood education part endowment or human capital? It can be both, all right? And the endowment, uh, I would like to interpret more loosely than ge just genetic. It could be uh, family culture as well, and that's sort of where I'm going. Okay, so I was going to ask how ages differ between secondary and genetic, but I think Yeah, yeah, it could be that. Uh, 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 but I'll, but you know, maybe uh, there could be, d you know, some people do argue uh, uh, along genetic differences uh, uh, as well. Why don't we go there, all right? Uh, so um, let's, um, so the, the point of that discussion is to do good applied economics, you need theory. You need theory to help you frame the discussion and you can't give that intergenerational elasticity that varies across countries a causal interpretation, all right? So I'm just going to summarize what I see as the causes of, uh, of the uh, elasticities and along the different dimensions that countries could differ. First of all, I want to put to you that public policy has an impact, all right? And that the extent to which public policy is more progressive, that is of relatively more advantage to the relatively disadvantaged, that's going to be mobility enhancing. But we have a choice uh, on how to design our, our public systems from, from early childhood education to the tax systems. They could be of relatively more advantage to the already advantaged. All right? So another transmission mechanism for inequality is in higher inequality, and probably through wealth as well, uh, concentrates power, skews the political process, and changes the public policies that, that come out at the other end. So we have to be conscious of that. But here is my simultaneous equations model, if you will, uh, uh, with well-articulated exclusion restrictions. <laughs> so you can think of those countries along that Great Gatsby curve differing because of the configuration of these three fundal for, uh, fundamental forces uh, differing. Um, a child's outcomes in life certainly depend in an important way on, on the family not just on the monetary resources available in that family, but also on the non-monetary resources, uh, the quality of the time and parenting. Uh, you don't have to be left or right to believe that, all right? But families interact with the labor market, and storms in the labor market buffet f uh, families. They have to get their income from the labor market. And how they interact and the structure of the labor market and the institutions of the labor market also matter. I mean, that's not left or right. Unions and minimum wages, they also matter, okay? Uh, and growing inequality uh, in the returns to human capital, those are labor market things that can split families apart too, all right? And then the state can support families offering insurance, buffering fr them from these storms, and investing in its own right in the structure of the uh, education, the healthcare system, and, and other policies. So it gets very complicated. I mean, um, uh, countries could be very similarly located on the Great Gatsby Curve. Italy, the United Kingdom, and the United States were all in the same position, but the, 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 the reasons they're there could be very different. And so there's no one silver bullet, if you will, that will uh, determine uh, those, uh, those outcomes. All right? So here, are some stylized facts with this um, framework of theory that we have that I want to work through. And I should sort of be done in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, and we'll have time for, for questions. What I've put here is that a measure, if you will, a rough measure of that gamma, the returns to education. So as you move in this direction, 
okay? The amount of money that a college graduate makes relative to someone with just a high school diploma goes up. So this says in the United States, if you have a college degree, you're making about 70% more than somebody with just a, uh, a high school diploma. If you live in Denmark, all right, that advantage to a, uh, to a college education is less than 20%. So this is a, a little test of our, our, our theory. As the returns to human capital go up, the degree of mobility gets more and more sticky. Now, obviously, there are outliers here. In Italy, there is hardly any return to uh, getting a university education. Uh, university is free in Italy, too, and so it's a great consumption good. It takes a long time to uh, finish your uh, degree, but there's no payback to it. And yet, there's a great deal of stickiness. So in that country, we should look to other things, all right? But to the United States, labor market inequality measured in this way might be somewhere we'd want to look, <laughs> all right? So if education really matters, the next thing I ask myself is, who gets it? So here I've taken uh, another gradient. This is the uh, number of years of schooling you get for every extra year of schooling your parents get. And this is uh, information from a really nice paper by uh, Tom Hertz, who's actually uh, in the uh, audience uh, uh, tonight, and a list of many co-authors, uh, but uh, what Tom's giving us here is another type of uh, a gradient, the gradient between your education and your parents' education. So as you move in this axis, the people who get more schooling are the people whose parents have a lot of schooling, okay? And um, maybe that's somewhere where you want to focus if you're thinking about the United Kingdom, all right? But I want to focus our attention in this dimension on the United States. Here's another way of looking at that same gradient. I've organized a group of uh, uh, young teens, people roughly in about grade eight, 14 year olds or so, according to whether their parents had a high a level of education, that is a college degree, um, a medium level, and a low level of education. Low level of education uh, is high school or less, and then medium is something more than that, but not a college degree. And these are, the fraction of this population that are proficient in various mathematics skills. Okay? So let's just take, for the sake of example, fractions. Now, we may certainly be concerned by the fact that by the age of 14, people coming from a relatively privileged background, mm, less than six of ten of them are proficient in, in doing fractions okay? by the age of 14. That's a comment, I think, on the primary school system, all right? But I also want to draw to your attention to how much that fades away as family background changes. If your parents only had a high school education, less than one in five of those kids have proficiency in handling fractions. Now, math is not everything in life, uh, but it's one of the skills you need to become all that you can be. And I can show you a graph like this with reading skills, and you get the same pattern. So if we're thinking of causal mechanisms, and if education is very important, who's getting it? All right? And who's developing the skills necessary to go further in life? All right? This is U.S. data uh, from what's called the, uh, the ECHLS, Early Childhood Longitudinal Study, for, for kids who were born in this era of higher inequality in the uh, uh, early 1990s, by the time they reached just on the cusp of high school. Now here's another version um, of the, this kind of information displayed in the way that Romer would want us to. Now the math score is through a sort of a, a multiple test, and it's got, it's got a continuous measure, and I've standardized this. So zero means the average score, and these are standard deviations. As you move this way, you're going to higher and higher test scores. And this is a very high number to be three standard deviations out. And this is a very low number. And then I've given you the cumulative distribution uh, of these, uh, this test according to parental background, high, medium, low. And so what this scale means is what fraction of individuals score below a particular level. So let's say take the average. If you come from a rather privileged background, 
only about 20% of those kids are scoring, scoring below the overall average. If your parents only had high school, 60% of those kids are below average. All right? So for Romer, if there was equality of opportunity, these curves would lie on top of each other. And this is a circumstance. It's a circumstance that a child's not responsible for. And this big gap is showing us, in his terms, uh, inequality of outcomes. And I can show you the same thing, though, for when they were in kindergarten. And it's striking how similar those curves are. Now, obviously, in kindergarten, you're not doing the same math test as you are in 14. It's an age-appropriate test. But you can predict a child's rank in this distribution when they're 14 by their rank when they were four or five. So what this says is, as well, that over this period, it's the same kids. We followed them longitudinally. Over this period, when they went through the primary school system, whatever the schooling system did, it didn't close those gaps. And then the other thing it tells us is those gaps were already there by the age of four or five. You want to look to the early years, and you want to figure out if the schooling system can do anything. OK? Uh, it's even worse for reading. So these are reading skills. Uh, uh, here, um, the people um, whose parents only had a high school degree are actually losing ground. Oops, are, are actually losing ground uh, by going through the schooling system, and the people who are picking it up are the, the most privileged groups. All right. So, who's getting the education, and is that and is the education becoming more and more important? Is that playing field tilted? All right. So resources matter. I want to focus on the relatively advantaged group for a bit, and then the relatively disadvantaged. Then I'll conclude. Here's something I found interesting. I picked it up uh, from uh, Forbes magazine a couple of years ago. And it was around graduation time. And an enterprising uh, reporter at Forbes, this was I think in 2011 or 2012, went out and she asked herself, what, what new jobs are the graduates this year getting that did not even exist 10 years ago? And so on that list, there are some things you can imagine. Um, an app developer was a very popular job uh, for new graduates. And 10 years ago, an app de uh, developer didn't exist. A market research data miner and social media manager were also new occupations that were very popular but did not exist. But what caught my eye was the educational or admissions consultant. <coughs> when a certain set of affluent parents watch their toddlers stack his or her first set of blocks, they're not lost in a moment of cute. They're strategizing their child's likely of getting into the right preschool. These moms and dads will stop at nothing to secure the best education for their kids, which for many includes hiring an educational or admissions consultant to help ease the process of interviewing and testing into schools from preschool to college. Admissions consultants can be paid thousands of dollars for their skills, which often include personal connections with school administrators. So there's a lot of competition for the early um, childhood education spots on the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan. And the price is going up. So in an era of inequality, uh, higher inequality, two things happen. Rich people have more resources, and they have more incentives. All right? And this is a story, but you can sort of see it in the data. Uh, here is a, 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 chapter, a, a picture from a, a book by Greg Duncan and, and Dick Moraine. And, and they look at something called enrichment expenditures. All those other things, I've listed them here, that parents do in developing their human, um, the human capital skills of their kids outside of the schooling system. In the 1970s, if your parents' income was in the bottom fifth of the income distribution, on average, parents spent about $835 a year. Parents at the top fifth of the income distribution spent $3,500 a year. That was a big gap. Over these decades, inequality increased, and that gap ballooned. All right? So that on average, people in the top fifth of the income distribution parents <coughs> are spending almost $9,000 a year on enrichment expenditures. Now, this doesn't say anything about the effectiveness of this, but it clearly shows you that as parents perceive that return to human capital changing, they're going to put all the resources they can, and they're going to change their behavior to invest in their kids. 
and that's going to advantage some more than others. But more than money matters, here from a, a recent paper done by a couple of researchers at the U.S. Census Bureau is the fraction of um, young men working at the very same employer as their father. Okay, so it's not the same occupation, the same industry, it's the same employer. Arranged by the father's earning decile. So these are fathers in the bottom 10%, these are fathers at the top 10%. Fathers of the uh, sons at the bottom 10%, about 7.5% of those sons worked for the same employer that uh, employed their father. Uh, but that rises tremendously, uh, or significantly at the top. All right? And you see this in other countries. Here is a slightly different measure, but related for Canada and Denmark by the percentile of uh, the father's uh, place in the income distribution. So people over here are the top one percenters. And the measure is a little bit broader here. It's uh, by the age of 30, have you ever worked at an employer that uh, employed your father from the age of 16 or uh, to 30 at any point in time, even a summer job, uh, uh, did you have an employer that your father said he also had? And you can see it's quite high. Four in 10 Canadians uh, say that's the case. Uh, something less than 30% uh, of, of the Danes. And if you had the U.S. figure, it would be about 22%. But what's important here is that shoots up at the top. So there's some other advantages that have uh, a very complicated relationship with human uh, capital that reflect your outcomes as well. All right. I'm not sure I can call it nepotism yet, but you'd want to sort of look not just at the early years, but how labor markets work and how good jobs get allocated. Uh, let me conclude then with looking at the relatively disadvantage. One of the things that distinguishes the United States from many of those other countries is the, situ the income situation of kids. And it, there's a great discussion in the great da Gatsby curve on whether money is causal or not. And what I've tried to say to you that, well, money's not everything, but it's still something. If we place Canadian children in the American income distribution, a lot fewer of them would be at the bottom. And a lot fewer of them would be at the top. Canadian kids would be sort of lower middle class kids. Now this is the entire American income distribution. So kids generally live in less um, uh, well endowed families. So that's why they're not lining up uh, at 10% here because we're placing them in the overall income distribution. But there are more kids uh, uh, American kids at the very top and a lot more at the very bottom. I'd be concerned in some absolute sense about the income floor that society places on the situation of kids. All right. And then briefly, uh, I want to outline the very different family situation kids face. Uh, and not all comparisons are appropriate. As I suggested, Maybe it doesn't make sense to compare the United States to Denmark, but maybe it makes a little bit more sense to compare it to uh, other countries like the United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia. These are also all very diverse uh, societies, and uh, they share a lot in common. And the policy process, there's a lot of learning that goes on. Here is the situation of kids in these four countries. And the first fact is the United States, a child is much more likely to have uh, a teen mother. And again, I've organized this according to high, medium, and low parental education. And this really stands out. So the relatively disadvantaged in the U.S. have a much more challenging family uh, background. Um, teenage fertility rates are falling in the U.S. in spite of inequality going up. So that's a good thing, all right? But it really stands out. So here, the family is important, and uh, the starting line is very different. This is the percentage of children by the age of four or five living with both biological parents. And in the United States, in the most challenging situation, that's almost just a half. There's something that Andy, Andy Churlin, the sociologist here at Johns Hopkins, called the, uh, the family go-round. There's a lot more dynamic in the American family in which kids just see a lot more parental, uh, mer um, uh, maternal partners in the household. That's got to affect stability and upbringing uh, in, in, in some way. Um, 
percentage of mothers who are in poor health. So if you're trying to sort of get at the sense of the sort of the quality of the environment, uh, that, that can be important. And uh, the percentage of children uh, with immigrant parents. The U.S. is distinguished by having uh, um, the immigrant population being drawn from a lot um, lower education, uh, point in the educational spectrum. So there's all kinds of different situations uh, in these countries that call for different policy actions and give children a different start in life. So maybe I can just, if I can conclude, offer uh, three answers to those questions. I'll, 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 I'll let you read them and then just sort of perhaps uh, draw your attention to something that's implicit in this talk um, and particularly speaking to students uh, of this program. Um, I hope I've offered an example of what I think is a good exercise or what a good project in applied economics would look like. And for me, a good project uh, in applied economics sits on a three-legged stool. Um, the first is framing your research in a way that's policy relevant, all right? Speaking to a concern that policy makers need or, or their, their, their citizens uh, want addressed. That's number one. But you can't do that without the other two legs also supporting that stool. And that's an appreciation of economic theory as a way of framing your analysis <laughs> and structuring your interpretation of it. And the third crucial element is going uh, to the data in a respectful way, asking of it what you can get uh, from it. So that's how I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're coming. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, it was really interesting how you kind of characterized people, like, you know, calling up their boss or whatever and getting their son or daughter a job. And I feel like, and maybe I was judging the tone a little bit wrong, but there was, there seemed to be sort of more, maybe a disdain for that type of, of, um, of action. And I'm not sure, maybe I'm, maybe I'm judging it wrong. However, I do believe that's a lot of in our human nature. And I mean, two, you know, it's like, hey, if you have a connection, get your kid a job, get him into, you know, whatever job you're working in. And clearly those at the top are much more able to do that because of their connections, because of their income and whatnot. And so you kept mentioning um, leveling the playing field. And I would just... Um, I would kind of push back a little bit on that in the sense that I don't think it's important to necessarily try to fight against that human nature of trying to, obviously we're completely biased towards our children, right? We want them, you know, we want them to get Absolutely. ahead of anybody else just because the fact that they're our children. Um, but a policy wide, sort of a policy takeaway from that, not so much as like trying to combat human nature in that sense, but trying to make it more costly for unqualified children of rich people to be hired by their parents. So meaning if it wasn't genetically, if the ch children of these <coughs> rich parents are getting these jobs because of connections and not because of what they bring as their own human capital, we need to, as a society, create an environment where that's extremely costly for these businesses. So where, whereas, you know, it's not about the connections that get you ahead in the long run, it's about you know, what you bring to the table as far as human capital, as far as education and new ideas. Um, and so I think that's just m maybe a different way of looking at it. And again, maybe I t uh, read into what you were saying incorrectly, but I just was wondering what you had to comment on that. Okay. That, that's very well put. So thank you for that. Uh, um, so why don't, why don't we um, address that at two levels? First of all, let's spend a little time sort of interpreting that kind of dynamic. And so you, you see in this question, I think, a very clear articulation of, of what, what we called earlier so sort of the problem of the family for, for, for Romer, right? It's quite natural for every parent to do everything they can for their kids, and why should we stop that? Okay. Um, so, uh, and this is why we sort of need economic theory again. So let, let's think about that intergenerational transmission of employers. And there's this... Um, um, there's different ways of thinking of it in literature. Let's use the word nepotism and let's think of good nepotism. So for example, I met a, um, uh, a lawyer uh, 
He's, he's on Park Avenue. And he, he got his job from his firm, uh, from his father. He took over the firm. All right. And he was employed by his father. All right. But that employment, okay, increased his productivity in a certain way. Being a lawyer in that firm, uh, over time, helped him develop some very specific knowledge of clients and their needs. That knowledge was of value only in that firm. I mean, he's a lawyer, he could work anywhere, but that's a different set of clients he doesn't know anything about. So in some situations, that kind of investment can be thought of as a firm-specific investment that increases his productivity. In that sense, it seems like a, a good nepotism, right? Uh, on the other hand, you alluded to a situations in which the family firm just hires the next generation and productivity falls. And in fact, if you look at this literature on family firms, you see that they are of lower productivity and uh, when the CEO becomes a non-family member, productivity uh, changes. That seems like a sort of not meritocratically based system of allocating uh, top jobs. And presumably, we all suffer because growth is a little bit uh, lower. So there's a lot more, I think it's fair to say, there's a lot more to think about in that, that parameter. And if you sort of noticed something in my voice, I guess I was sort of slipping into thinking of that this is probably not meritocratic uh, overall. Either way, what can you do about it at that level for policy? I don't know, but you can sort of perhaps get around the problem of the family uh, this way, because it also matters uh, with a lot of earlier decisions, too. As you work your way through primary school, parents are pulling all kinds of strings and levers to get their kids into the right class with the right teacher. Uh, if something goes wrong, the principal hears about it, and they're promoting their kids through, through that whole um, uh, stage in, in, in their life. It seems to me that we somehow need to organize our systems so that we all benefit from that energy, so that it spills over. So for example, I've been, I was a notorious free rider when my kids were going through primary school. You know, fathers aren't all that engaged. My wife was more engaged than I. But I tell you, there's no stronger force in, this, in the primary school playground than some of the, the uh, mothers in my neighborhood. And if something went wrong with a particular teacher, the principal heard about it. That. And didn't require any benefit from my half, my part, but my kids benefited as well. Imagine a schooling system in which things are very segregated and uh, it's hard to get into it, uh, privately run so that uh, less advantaged kids get into it, so that there isn't any spillover of that effort. So that's the way I would think about it, not to um, somehow put a damper on the individual incentives that the family has, but to organize the system so that those efforts spill over and benefit others. And as for the intergenerational transmission of firms, you know, I, I don't know how to do that. But thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, great presentation. Um, I'm, as I'm watching you present, I've been reading a lot of uh, Anthony Giddens. Oh, yeah. And his theory of structuration. And he would maybe pose the question of um, maybe the way that the system is set up is it doesn't necessarily care that um, people are mobile or not. Um, such that the system is set up in a way that, um, you know, kind of like capitalism is almost king and um, people, are, people are, are, are kind of structured to behave in a way that mm. perpetuates the, the system. And the system almost requires a, a vast number of people who are on the underclass in order for it to perform in the way that it has, such that you know, who cares if people are not making, if people are not mobile. As long as the system continues, then no one, you know, like that's, that's, not, a, that's not an issue. But you're yeah. posing it now as an issue, and I think it is an issue. So it makes me think, well, then if, if we really want to tackle this problem, then it becomes a tackle, it becomes an issue of maybe income disparity, raising up minimum wages such that there's not this huge, mm -hmm. this huge, this huge gap. 
and maybe you know instituting some of this um, uh, uh, Head Start programs mm -hmm. and having them mandatory, having them funded all the time. If this, if if the if the goal that you're reaching for is a goal that we have as a society as a whole. Hmm. Um, maybe two things. Um, first of all, I appreciate you also putting the focus on the structure of the labor market, and that's an important causal force. Uh, so we talk about sort of you know the importance of middle class economics and sort of growing the system out from from the middle. Uh, inclusive growth. So the way the labor market functions, I think, is very important in this discussion. Um, I guess I just sort of push back a little bit about, quote unquote, the system. I think uh, we see in the data we presented a lot of variation in capitalism and in the place of the state in it. So I'm not sure uh, that I can sort of buy into one system here. It's certainly I think fair to say that different societies legitimize the income distribution in different ways. And in the United States, there is probably, and I'm perhaps on a bit shaky ground, uh, but I think sociologists would suggest that there is more of a view of inequality as resulting from individual effort and, and responsibility. And we somehow legitimize that because there is a great deal of, 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 of mobility or potential for it. So just having an awareness of these facts, I think, is important for appreciating the extent to which that really is so and perhaps getting public support for the kind of policies that you suggest would, would, would change it. And uh, somehow perhaps to question those value judgments. But there can be different value judgments in different countries, and the systems work differently. And the fact that I've paired up uh, Canada, Australia, and UK, uh, very similar countries with very different outcomes, it, it seems at some point it's a question of public policy choice, too. And we have time for one more question. I wanted to throw uh, two additional uh, circumstances out there for your consideration. You spoke about the issue of uh, cultural homogeneity, mentioning that uh, Denmark is a relatively homogeneous country. And um, I think many people sort of take it for granted that that would promote mobility. But I think one of the starkest ways to illustrate that is that if you look at white America, you actually have uh, mobility numbers that are not that different from the social democracies of, of Northern Europe. Um, so a large part of the stickiness of the American in income distribution is from the inheritance of circumstances of namely the race of your parents. So that's a, it's a pretty powerful illustration of uh, what circumstance can mean. And taking that to one level further, if you, if you pool the nations of the world, then you would notice that the accident of birth of which country you happen to be born in is an extremely powerful predictor of where you're going to end up. Um, and uh, that certainly is, is something that children have no control of. Okay. Tom, of course, is one of the authors of one of those studies, so he, he knows better than I. But, um, but let, me, let me add a little bit to your discussion about race, and, and we talked about this earlier just before the discussion. I didn't draw your attention to some recent studies that have paid a lot of attention to how intergenerational mobility varies within the United States. And some of you may have been familiar um, with these studies by Raj Chetty of Harvard and his, his co-authors. As interesting as these international comparisons are, it's probably more interesting uh, to compare uh, the different regions of the US. And there's a great deal of variation. And in particular, as, as, as Tom has alluded to, a lot less mobility in the South. Um, but also, in communities where there are um, a large fraction of, of blacks, even the whites don't do well there. So I don't think it's you know, as simple as, uh, as race in that regard. Um, uh, so it is, a, is a, it is a complicated story. And um, parts of the United States are as mobile, if not um, more mobile than many countries, as mobile as Denmark. And uh, other parts of the US, extremely sticky. And that, I think, is an interesting uh, research agenda. Um, but I don't think it's inherently in race, but, it, but the, the, the circumstance of, of, of history that's, that's put people in a particular situation. Thank you very much. Uh, there are trade-offs in life everywhere. It's time to go to the reception. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.